Welcome back to Enjoy the Book of Life. Here we're going to do another People, Places, and Things, and we're going to emphasize or look at three different kind of plants. We're going to look at the fig tree, the olive tree, and the vine all the way through Scripture and what we can learn from that. So again, what catches your eye to make this connection through the Scriptures? I think one of the important ideas in the Bible is that rarely does God use synonyms for the same thing. Now, by that I don't mean, for example, the church. Ah, oh, the church is a building. The church is a bride. The church is a, a body, right? Yeah, those are different pictures. But when I read the church as a body, I should think, oh, it's a body in what particular way? So the idea of a building is not the same as a body. You don't want a building to be athletic and move around. Uh, it want, you want it to stay put, established, right, built up. Whereas a body, you do want it to function, and it has moving parts, and it does things differently than, than a building. And the same with a bride. So when we read Christ is a lion and Christ is a lamb, we say, okay, we read, oh, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, or he's the lamb of God. We say, oh, I know who that is. That's Jesus. Yes, but it's Jesus in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And so even though we might say, well, these are all synonymous terms for Jesus. No, they're not. They, they are very specific in their rendition. Right, because we've got the devil is a lion. Exactly. And we're sheep. Right, right. And right. So obviously it's going to be in a different way than the Lord Jesus is a lion or a lamb. Right. Well, he says as a sheep before a shears is dumb. Jesus is like a sheep in his uh, his uh, suffering, uh, his um, silence in suffering. But we are sheep in the way we go astray yeah. in our stupidity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, yes. So generally speaking, with a type, uh, there's one point to it. Mm -hmm. And it we need to catch that point and not turn it into an allegory where there are a lot of things because people will say oh yeah this is you know uh, we should be salt and light and so they say salt you know that used to cure f fish and it's used to to do this and melt ice and all kinds of things it's used for but yes what did jesus mean what was his point right. with right. the use of salt and so i think this is important that we we again allow our imagination to see what God is saying, like thinking God's thoughts, not making up our own thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to turn typology into modern art where anything right. can be anything yeah. and anything can become anything else. That's yeah. not the idea. So these uh, three plants are used to illustrate the nation of Israel. And historically, when I was growing up, I heard very often that it describes um, the past, present, and future of Israel. Hmm. So they would say that um, the the olive is their past, or the the vine is their past, and the fig is their present, and the the olive is their future, or something like that. It never seemed to fit for me, and so uh, I I wasn't happy with that. And then I was reading a book, and you know, if you can find one really good idea in a book that that unlocks a truth that throughout Scripture, it's well worth the price of the book. Yeah. And that's what I found, a book by Arthur Custance again, in which he talks about um, these three as being uh, the history of Israel in three dimensions. That the fig is their religious history, and the olive is their spiritual history, and the vine is their national history history, the history of their national testimony. Uh, somebody might say religious and spiritual, isn't that splitting hairs? Right, right. But in actual fact, when the Lord Jesus came, their spiritual history was at its lowest and their religious history was at its highest. Yeah. So there's very little connection between their religion and their spirituality. Um, but this is very important for us in understanding the scripture. So here's a famous statement regarding the fig. Um, in Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. 
when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And so people have read this and said, okay, so the blossoming of the fig tree, that would be Israel's uh, rebirth as a nation in 1948. So all we have to do now is figure out what a generation is. Right. And we know when the Lord's going to come back. Right? Well, that's assuming that the fig is a picture of their national history. Mm. But it's not. It's a picture of their religious history. And mm. we'll see how that follows all the way through Scripture. And so because it's a picture of their religious history, what is their religion? It's priesthood sacrifices and temple worship today do the jews have a priesthood no do they have an altar no do they have sacrifices no mm -hmm. uh, and so the generation that sees the rebirth of israel's religious history when anti-messiah builds a temple for them and they reinstitute the sacrifices and the priesthood that generation will see the lord come in power and glory mm -hmm. which of course is within seven years. Right. So um, I think it's important for us to, to get the key right, right. and not right. hammer it into the lock, say, I can make this fit. Mm. Well, it won't be useful anywhere else because you've ruined it. You've ruined the lock. Yeah. And, and so as, as we look at the subject of the fig, for example, it starts right at the beginning of history. We read that Adam and Eve took fig leaves to cover themselves, right? And what is this a picture of? Why does God say that won't do? Because it, I'm sure it covered their nakedness, but it didn't reveal God's holiness, that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And so God made coats for them. He didn't give them skins and say, make something nice. You know, uh, he made the coats. This idea that salvation is a completed thing by God, he gives us our our new uniform, it's, it's already made, it's finished. It's not something that we work on and improve. So when we think about the fig leaves, this was a picture of man's religion in seeking to uh, appease God but please themselves without the shedding of blood. Right, and like you said, it, it covered their nakedness. It was fine when they were together. But once God entered the scene, they hid behind trees. That's right. You know? That's right. It didn't work. It <laughs> yeah. didn't work. Right. And man's religion doesn't work. Yeah. When we're around each other, we say, look at my nice outfit here, my nice green outfit. That's right. But when God shows up, all of a sudden, they, they realize they were still naked. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not like other men, said the Pharisee. Right. Right. He, right. You know, the, his religion made it seem, oh, when I'm with others, this is all good. But again, when you get introduced to God, you have to come like the publican. Uh, yeah. God yeah. be merciful to me, the sinner. Yeah. Right, and the, and the scripture says that, that we're uh, open and exposed before the God with whom we have to do. God, God sees right through the fig leaves. Yeah. But he doesn't, as it were, see through the sacrifice of Christ. He doesn't see uh, our sin is covered and sat God is satisfied. And so that's the the robes of righteousness that are provided for us, mm -hmm. they work, but man's religious robes don't work. And then we see the fig tree that's just leaves uh, when the Lord Jesus comes on the scene. Right, right. So uh, on the way there, we, we have this situation where Israel has fallen into terrible decline, and... Um, God is going to allow some of them to be taken off into captivity. And the assumption of the people would be the good guys are going to get to stay in the land. Mm. It's the bad guys that are being taken away. But God said no, and he gave this picture of a basket of, of good figs and another basket of rotting figs. And God is saying, look, I can't do anything with the rotting figs that I'm leaving in the land here. At least the ones who are being taken away, they've maintained the religion I gave them. And I'll work with them and I'll bring them back as olive berries. I'll bring a spiritual remnant mm. back. Mm. Um, 
So he wanted the people to understand, no, the, the, the ones who are being taken away, I see them as salvageable, and I'm going to work with them. But these and, and, ones here are rotting figs. Yeah, we see that with Daniel. When they're, when they're leaving, him and his friends, they purpose in their heart to follow in the, the ways that they were supposed to. Right. Following right. in the religion of, of Israel. Right. So that's in uh, Jeremiah 24, where hmm. we have the illustration of the good figs and the rotting figs. Right, so then, then we have Matthew 21. We have the cursed tree. This is the, the only miracle of Jesus that seems to be negative. Mm. Like he's upset. He lo lost his temper. Like, you know, I wanted some figs and they're not here, so, mm -hmm. so there, zap, you know. This is the sort of uh, petulance we see in the Greek gods, mm, <laughs> the, yeah. the Roman gods, right? <laughs> That's not Jesus. He didn't lose his temper. Um Every time he met with the Pharisees, he used withering words. And his whole objective was to shrivel away their empty religion, to show them there was no fruit for God there. Hmm. And so this was a picture of the nation as it was, with all their religion, all their show, but there was no fruit. And they couldn't have fruit that way. The works of the flesh are manifest. The fruit that comes is only by the fruit of the Spirit. So um, the, the fig is this picture consistently through the scripture. Uh, now, James asks an interesting question. He says, can a fig tree bear olive berries? And um, the Lord Jesus says to Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. Now here is a real olive berry under the fig tree. Mm. Uh, he was a true spiritual man looking for the Messiah. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, the, he, wasn't, he wasn't the result of the empty religion of Judaism. He had a living relationship with God. But, uh, but there he was in that setting, as it were, under the fig tree. And, and the Lord Jesus recognized the true spirituality in his heart. Right. Mm. So the, the, this idea of the figs runs all the way through to the book of Revelation. Um, Isaiah chapter 34 verse 4 talks about those days, the casting of untimely figs. And that idea is carried over into the book of the Revelation, uh, chapter 6, where we see the judgment of God. Just as on that occasion, uh, the Lord judged the nation and prove that their religion would not save them. So this will happen during the time of the tribulation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. When, when Jacob, God dealt with him in far, far off Paddan Aram, where his family were worshiping idols, and all he cared about was making money. And the Lord had to bring him all the way back, every step that he'd gone away from Bethel, back to the house of God. And of course, the, the signal moment was when he wrestled with a man and realized he was looking at the face of God. Mm. What a moment. Uh, what, what's a monotheistic Jew supposed to do yeah. when he's wrestling with a man and finds out that he's wrestling with God himself? Mm. And so wh where do you see the face of God, right? This was Jesus coming into the world. The, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What did they do with that face? They marred it more than any man. They tried to disfigure it. Hmm. And then finally when he died, they said, ah, the light's out. But a few days later, they're walking down the street. They see the same light shining from Stephen's face. Yeah. Right? It's the same light of the glory of God reflected from, from the believers. And so the world will be happy when they put out the light. Hmm. The Christians are gone. It's great in the dark. Don't you love it in the dark? They love darkness rather than light. But then they'll see these witnesses shining for God. They're called the sons of oil. They're, they're pictured by these two olive trees growing up, bearing light for God. And, and once again, they will seek to destroy it and they'll kill them but then they'll be resurrected and it won't be long until their master shows up, the, the son of righteousness, 
shining forth like the sun in his strength. There'll be no way to shut down the sun yeah. when he shows up, right? So, so this idea of the fig being a picture of their religion, uh, even good religion, like men like Daniel, was not enough. And when the Lord Jesus came, he judged their empty religion and showed them that there was no fruit for God. So that's the theme that runs all the way through. And, and that's how we should understand, I think, Matthew 24. When we come to the olive tree, that begins over in Genesis chapter 8. And we have this idea of the olive all the way through scripture. <coughs> the olive oil was so essential to the Jewish people. And, uh, of course, it was used in the Bible for anointing. It was used for healing. It was used for food, it was used for light, and it was used for warmth. Mm -hmm. And these are the ministries of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who anoints us for our service. <clears throat> He's the one who gives us light for our pathway. He's the one who feeds us uh, the, the truth of God to sustain us. He's the one who is our comforter that comes to heal us. And he's the one who provides warmth, the fellowship among the people of God, all comes through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus goes to a place called Gethsemane, or in the original, Gatshemna, which means the olive press. Hmm. And in order to get the good of the olive berry, it has to be crushed. And there the Lord Jesus was crushed so that we could reap the benefits of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus had to go through his agony and then be exalted and glorified so that the Holy Spirit could come with these benefits. So um, we, we have many, many stories about the olive, the olive tree. And, um, and as I mentioned in Zechariah 4, this idea of the two sons of oil, this is the closest thing we have to a perpetual motion machine where the olive trees are actually growing in the dark. And this is, this is a, a picture of all of God's witnesses that we're growing in the dark. This is the dark night of this world. But we're not left to that. Um, we have the menorah. We have the light of truth filled with the oil of the Spirit. And so the menorah causes the trees to grow. And the trees produce the olive berries. And then there were these golden pipes that led back to the, the menorah. And so the olive berries produce the olive oil that runs down the golden pipes that produces the fuel for the menorah to continue shining. And so we have this amazing synergy between the believers and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses us to shine for him. We're speaking the very words of God. We can't do it on our own. The only reason we can grow and flourish in the dark is because the Holy Spirit is mm. feeding this to us. But at the same time, we then are representing the Spirit and doing His work in the world in testimony. So we have this perpetual motion machine. And you know, this is so important to realize. Christians talk about being burned out. Why are we burned out? Mm. My mother at Christmas, we didn't have a lot of decorations. We, we looked like the Jehovah's Witness and the Jews on our street because we didn't have any Christmas lights. But one thing my mother had was like a, a big bowl and she filled it with oil, cooking oil. And there was a, a little plastic disc and it had a, a wick in it. And you lit that wick and as long as it was floating in the oil, it never burned out. Mm -hmm. and, and so if we're, so to speak, floating in the oil, the Holy Spirit of God if we're depending on our own resources, we're going to burn out in a hurry. Yeah. But if we have the endless resources of the Spirit, he just pours that through us and we live in the, in the, the good of the power of the Spirit of God. Hmm. So uh, the olive is a beautiful picture of this idea of the, um, the dependability of the Holy Spirit who comes to us by virtue of the crushing of Christ. And through this, we represent God in this dark world. We shine for him. We grow for him. People say, how do you grow in a world like this? And the secret is the, 
the Holy Spirit of God is um, not only motivating us and equipping us, but feeding us, so to speak. The very life of Christ is flowing through us by the Spirit. So it's a beautiful picture of the of the olive. And, and again, a parable in Luke 13, the green olive tree in Jeremiah eleven sixteen, all speak to us about this idea of true spiritual Israel hmm. and, the, and the people of God uh, not relying on um, religion, but relying on the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Um, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That comes out of Zechariah chapter 4 the discussion of the of the olive trees. And then, of course, we come to the vine. <clears throat> now, the vine begins, if you will, um, with the exodus out of Egypt. The Lord says, I took a vine out of Egypt. So they went in a family, they came out a nation. And so God's intention all along was, yes, to select Abraham, but that through Abraham there would come a nation. The nations had rejected God, and they were worshiping the creation instead of the creator. They were, they were saying that the supreme forces in the universe were um, the, the force of growth in the ground, and the power of the sea, and the wind, and the sun, and, and uh, a passion for war, and passion for love. These were the forces. They were impersonal, mindless forces that ran the universe. Which, of course, we see in the Exodus, God going toe-to-toe with the deities of Egypt. Exactly right. And this is where the Western world has returned. Mm. So now the supreme uh, influences in the world are what? The amoeba, right? Uh, The sex drive. Uh, I got to do it. I mean, you know... It's just like eating food. I got to eat. I, I see this pretty thing. So whether I'm married or not, you got to follow your heart. You got to do, right? This whole idea that I'm run by by enzymes and by um, hormones, hormones and, yeah. and, and I am who I am. I'm simply a chemical reaction. I'm, uh, that's all I am, right? Hmm. And this is a horrible view of man. It's a horrible view of God. And so God was going to raise up a nation as a divine protest against this idea that the universe is run by impersonal forces working on mindless matter. And he was going to show what it was like for a nation whose God is the Lord. That was the idea. And so they were brought out and he said, I'm going to plant this vine by the roadside where their roots are in me. And in this desert world, they'll be able to grow this sweet fruit. And people will come along. I'm I'm planting them in the nexus of the ancient world, where the connection is between Africa and Asia and Europe. And anybody traveling between the superpowers of the ancient world would travel right through this little country. It's a land bridge. Everything to the west is the... Mediterranean, everything to the east is the Arabian Desert. This is You come through this, what's called the Levant, mm-hmm. this little green land bridge. And, and people will bump into the Jews. And they'll say, how can you be so happy? How can you be so, so uh, self-sacrificing? How can you be so peaceful? How can you live like this? And the Jews would be able to say, well, the secret is our God. We're not rooted in this world. We're rooted in God. And this is how we bear this fruit. But what happened? They got their roots into this world. Mm. And they worshipped the same gods that the pagans worshipped. And they turned their back on a personal relationship. They said, Moses, you talk to God and just give us the rule book. We don't want this relationship with God. And, and so God said, you know, the, you read Isaiah's song of the, of the vineyard. Yeah. He takes God's part and he says, I, I did everything for you. I, I planted you and I surrounded you with a wall and I built a tower and I, and I watered you and cared for you. And what do I get? Nothing but sour grapes. Mm. And so when people came into contact with the Jews, it set their teeth on edge and they said, ooh, if that's what 
the God of Israel is like, I, I don't want anything to do with him. Hmm. And, and so, now it wasn't totally that way because there were people like Joseph and people like Daniel and uh, people like uh, Esther who introduced uh, the pagan world to the true God. That It was true. But as a nation, they failed. Hmm. So much so, when the vineyard owner sent his son to gather the vintage, they said, here's the heir, let's kill him. What are you going to do with people like that? He says, right? So the Lord <clears throat> tells the story of the true vine. And he says, John 15, I am the true vine. He didn't mean Israel was a false vine. Um, any more than when he said, I'm the true bread, he meant that the manna was false bread. No, I am the bread of which the manna spoke. I am the vine on which Israel was supposed to grow. They, were, they thought they were the vine. But I'm the vine. I've always been. Who was David growing on when he produced these delicious grapes we call the Messianic Psalms? It tastes just like Jesus, just like God when you read it. Who was Abraham growing on when he rejoiced to see my day and was glad? Where did that vintage come from? Well, it came from him growing on me. He was looking forward. He was living in the expectation of me. And so uh, the, I have always been the true vine. And there are branches in me that don't bear fruit. In other words, they had a connection with Jesus uh, through his messianic claims, but they were not related to him in life. They didn't share the life of God. Yeah, this is where it goes back to the idea of the vine being a national idea. So there are people who nationally were associated with the Lord Jesus in that they were sons of Abraham. Right, right. They, but they, they didn't have that life, his life in them. Right. And so they were scheming to cut him off. And so he explained to the disciples that night, no, no, I'm the vine. They're the ones who are going to be cut off. Yeah. And you are going to be pruned and purged. And you're going to produce fruit, more fruit, much fruit, fruit that remains. In other words, I am replacing the idea of national testimony with international testimony. Out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, people, and nation, there will be those who will have their roots in God, and they will be bearing this sweet fruit. So I've had the privilege of traveling all around the world to see the sweet fruit that's growing from Christ in China and India and Japan and all over the world. The sweet fruit that comes from, from putting your roots in God, right? And so the whole idea is, as we bear this sweet fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, real love, love for the unlovable, not love for the people that are just like us, but loving the unlovable, and joy in the midst of sorrow, with tears streaming down our faces, saying, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It shocks people. Mm. When my grandson died, and, and Scott, the father, stood up and made this declaration, and when his mother said to me at the graveside, I want you to quote that verse. This is our testimony. There were workmates who had come to the funeral and who told him afterwards, we never would have thought to bring our families here. We thought this would have been the most depressing, the saddest thing. But we saw you had joy in the midst of it all. We want that. They mm. went to the boss and said, we want him to start a study. That's what we need for our families. Mm. They tasted the sweet fruit that was produced by having your roots in God theme of the vine runs all the way through scripture. Um, Isaiah 5, Jeremiah 2, Ezekiel 17, Hosea 10, Joel 1, Deuteronomy 32, all the way through scripture. And uh, I just close with this thought. Um, uh, a vine grows quietly, um, unassumingly, but it's astounding how quickly the vine can come to bear fruit. We uh, lived our first home was right 
uh, surrounded by vineyards. Uh, in southern Ontario, uh, Welch is, has 10,000 acres of grapes. And uh, in the spring, you'd see these Italian women mostly, and they would go out there and they would cut those vines right back to the nubbin. It just looked like they'd killed them. But it wasn't only a few weeks, it seemed, and you started to see the green shoots. And then before uh, September, there were these luscious bunches of grapes. And, you know, sometimes we resist the pruning. Mm. Lord, I can't afford to let you take this. And he says, well, if you just trust me in this, what I'm cutting away, this dead wood, these suckers, they're not doing you any good. I want you to be fruitful. I want fruit, more fruit, much fruit, fruit that remains. In the song originally that Isaiah sings on behalf of God, it concludes with these words. What more can I do? Hmm. When we turn to the New Testament, the Lord Jesus takes up the song and he finishes it. What more can I do? I will send my only son. And that's the more that the Lord did, right? He sent yep. the, 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 the son of the vineyard owner became the vine that produces the fruit. Hmm. He doesn't just show up and say, gimme, gimme, gimme. He's the one who flows his life through us to produce this abundant fruit. And so the whole objective is that as fruit is born, he said, in this is my father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. In other words, that's what I did. Mm. I bore much fruit and I want you to be like me in this in bearing fruit for my father's sake. And what a joy to see it all over the world. Little Christians taking it in the teeth and smiling and saying, that's okay. I, I, I don't take it personally. Um, how can they do that? Because they have the spirit of Jesus in them who did exactly the same thing. And, and so these three pictures of the fig, the olive, and the vine um, the, the fig primarily um, is something that really isn't used much of, of the true life of the believer. But the olive and the vine are. And the olive primarily speaks <coughs> of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Whereas the vine speaks of the life of Christ in the believer. The one focuses on light and testimony and the other focuses on fruitfulness the reality of life in the believer. And they're just beautiful pictures. Uh, initially started to illustrate the nation of Israel, but then expanded to include all of God's people who now have been grafted in to share the life. Right, and we see that in Romans. Um, and I think w that's one of those, both John 15 and in Romans 11, where they're talking about the vine and the olive tree, those can uh, be, people will have some interesting interpretations of those. Right. Because again, I think they, they look at them very differently. Yeah. And that's one of the joys of this kind of study where we're in the people, places, things, where we trace it all the way through the scriptures. And again, that, illustration you give with the key in the lock does the key fit all the way through right. and if not you know, re-examining and finding how does this fit so that when we get to those difficult passages the right. key still fits yeah and that's key when we look at the at the olive tree um, if we have this idea like oh the olive tree is cut down and then you could be cut down like right. oh what what is that i lose my salvation here well, no, what he's saying is that for centuries, Israel was God's spiritual representative as a nation in the world. Like right? you were, we were mentioning there in that little land bridge, they were that representation. Right. Yeah. So if you want to know what on earth was happening in the world, you had to call Daniel in. You, yeah. had, you had to talk to Isaiah. You had to connect with these people who were in touch with God. They were God's reps. And he was speaking through them. He wasn't speaking through Gentiles. <clears throat> at a certain point, they became so corrupted that they could stand at the cross and say, we have a law, and by our law, he ought to die. So they were actually using the written word of God to condemn 
the incarnate word of God. Mm. And God said, that's it for that, right? And so all of a sudden now, you actually have Gentiles going out and representing God and speaking to Jews, as I've had the privilege of doing, and explaining to the Jews their own scriptures mm. and their own Messiah, right? And so uh, we see this shift. However, as time has gone by, we're not thinking individually, but corporately, Christendom today is in as bad shape as Judaism was in that day. So it has been historically true that for the last 2,000 years, if people want to know what does God say about something, they don't go to the Jews. They call up the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Pope or, or Billy Graham or someone, yeah. and they expect the Christians to know what's going on. But today, if you talk to the Pope, he says you don't have to follow Jesus to go to heaven. And uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury says you don't have to believe in the miracles or the deity of Christ. Hmm. And, and so all of a sudden it's like, what? You're supposed to be God's visible expression of truth in the world? God says, sorry, I'm going to cut you down and replace you again with the Jewish people so that during the time of the tribulation and into the millennium, they'll be taking hold of a Jew and saying, I know you've got the real thing. I want to go with you. Yeah. And, and so then the 144,000, the two witnesses, and eventually the whole nation, the restored nation, will once again become God's local reps and they will speak for God in the world. And that will be the original olive tree grafted back into its roots. We hope that you enjoyed this look at the fig tree, the olive tree, and the vine. And again, hopefully this will invigorate you in your own studies of these portions and others to find that key, make sure it fits all the way through the scriptures so that when you do get to these difficult paths,